welcome to worship. As I just said, I think a couple more will be trickling in as we go, but um, thanks for coming. Uh, happy Father's Day. Dad's out there. A um, couple of things before we really get into the heart of worship. Announcements, all of our schedule is up here on the screen, but the big two things is our 4th of July uh, booth at the festival and parade. Um, the second thing is our second block party, which is that following Friday, which the movie that night will be Moana. Um, it's going to be a busy few days because we'll have worship that Sunday on the 3rd. The booth is Monday on the 4th. All of our spiritual formation groups. And then we've got the block party, and then we loop back into worship again on the 10th. So uh, start taking your preemptive naps now. Start, start chugging the coffee, but it's, it'll be a great week uh, to really engage this community and to serve them. Um, and so those are the big couple things. There's other stuff up there too, but as we get into worship now, um, truly just take a moment, whatever you need to do to just quiet your heart. Prepare to come into the presence of the Lord with his people. Let's, let's just each take a moment and I'll open us up in a word of prayer here in a minute. Father, we thank you for this place. We thank you for the space. The chance to just come and encounter you. Father, we pray um, for those that we have near and far. May you use this time, this hour, to just draw us closer to you and by doing so draw closer to each other. May your name be praised. May you be glorified alone. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, if you'd please rise as we open up in worship with our first couple songs. Son of God and all his innocence you're walking in the dirt with you and me and he knows where living is he's acquainted with our grief man of sorrows son of suffering no There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who reached for me, hallelujah to the son of suffering, and some imagine you as distant and removed, but you chase us down and Your cross, my freedom, your strife. 
lives, my healing, no praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching, no praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Oh, and after 
the promises you're keeping. Be seated. Uh, each evening we gather to tell stories, really the story of Jesus coming alive in each of us. And, I mean, that, that song is just incredible. Just the different scenarios, the things that are, are real, the heartaches of life and knowing that the Lord is there with us. And in some ways, the reminder that it is okay to, in those moments, really run to Him. I think sometimes we kind of have this mindset of we need to just do it on our own, but that is definitely not the truth of Scripture. The truths of Scripture tell us we, we can't, but that we need Him. Um, and so we gather as a church to tell that story. Um, and each, each evening we ask two questions to kind of tell those stories, and it's where have you seen God show up and where do you need Him to show up in your life? So anybody have anything they'd like to share? Thanks, Cam. You're welcome. I think it'll pick you up. Last time I did it, it actually did pick up, so you don't have to come for it. You can. No. Uh, the Lord can hear me here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even my forte. Woof. Woof. <laughs> that was my still quiet voice. <laughs> it's getting deep tonight. Elizabeth. Yeah, our church is growing. <laughs> no, it. Uh, <laughs> I tell you what, that was some fancy Photoshop, because I saw Luke and Santina and a few of those, but no, it truly, uh, it, they told us it was a long day, but a good one. Mom and baby are healthy, and that is the important thing, and uh, they are home and enjoying his first Father's Day with a newborn, so not a, not a bad deal there. Yeah, I guess they weren't birthed last time. They were not, yeah. So this, is cool. this is truly his first, yeah. Kind of cool. Any others? I knew you were you were you were already you were itching. I could tell.
He did drop the mic on that one. Hey, it worked in Field of Dreams. <laughs> cool. Anything else? Thank you, guys. Awesome. Let's pray over these. God, we... Lord, I just absolutely love hearing how you're on the move in your children's lives. From the addition of family members to the recognition of the family you are building in a new city, in a new community. God, it is truly amazing to just celebrate what you are doing in your people's lives. We talk so much about the miracles of Scripture, but how about the miracles that you are performing each and every day? Lord, we just give you praise for them. We give you praise for busy uh, days, but we do pray for the stillness in the midst of those. That the work of our hands would be an offering to you and to you alone. May we not build our, our own altars to ourselves or to our bank accounts or to our families, but to truly to you. But we praise you when you do provide in unique ways. But Lord, in the midst of all that you are doing, from changing diapers for the first time to discerning job uncertainties to trying to build a new business, Lord, we just pray that you, for stillness in those moments. That they would not be storms of life, but rather oases where we can just rest and reap and drink of your presence and of your power. Father, we praise you for these moments that even each week we get to gather and at the very least set aside this hour to just hear from you. We spend a lot of our time telling you things and talking to you, but Lord, truly tonight give us ears to hear what you have to say. That as we open your scriptures, may this be a time of, of peace, a time of stillness in our lives and our minds and our hearts, and a time to just truly abide in you. Lord Jesus, we are here. As we open your word, may we come back to you. Amen. Old Testament reading is from Genesis 17, 1 through 8. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to, uh, to, be, wait, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. New Testament is from Hebrews 2, 1 through 13. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just resolution— how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? 
It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjugation under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjugation to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjugation to him, but we see him for a little while um, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Father, we thank you so much for the chance to gather together as your people. Um, Lord, we thank you that your spirit is present with us. God, we pray over David as he um, just delivers a message tonight that your words um, would be many through him, that he would listen to your spirit's leading. Father, we pray um, peace and um, clear communication over him. Lord, we pray um, just that your will would be done, that you would open our hearts Um, to what you would like to teach us tonight, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So this evening we continue in our Hebrews story um, and our series. We were able to to dive into chapter 1 last week in both worship and in our spiritual formation groups throughout the week, and we talked about the radiance of the glory of God. And just that beautiful phrase and how it is the exact imprint of his nature, which is, we talked about the engraving piece. So the radiance of the glory of God is engraved upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. We focused in on how he's the greater priest, because when he's done with the sacrifice, he gets to sit down. Something the priests of old never were able to do, because they had to constantly be sacrificing But his work was complete, so he got to sit down. We talked about how Christ was the greater prophet, how God used to speak through the prophets of old in the Old Testament. But since the days of Jesus has chosen to use the prophetic office through him, again, completing the story and the lineage of the prophets of old. We talked about how Jesus is the greater king because he is the heir of all things. And we even talked about how he's the greater spiritual being, greater than the angels. This week, we continue through what is known as the Sermon of the Book of Hebrews, because if you remember last week, we also mentioned that the, probably the best understanding of this book is that it was a sermon of Paul's that Luke wrote down, and then it was sent to ethnically Jewish Christians who were facing persecution and pressure to turn back to old-school Judaism and away from Jesus. Now we're going to continue more in this story. Chapter 2, the part that Elizabeth just read, is, is really a warning for us. That we need to fully understand the message that we've been told about Jesus so we don't drift away. Implying that the message of Jesus is enough to be our anchor in life. Recently, I was reading a book, and the author was telling the story. He was on a uh, sailing cruise around the British Virgin Islands with a couple friends. One owned the boat, so he was kind of in charge, and he was telling them that every night they needed to hoist anchor, lower it, drop it to the bottom of the seafloor. Then one of them had to get into their scuba gear and dive down and make sure that anchor was secure. Because if it wasn't, they would slowly drift. And at first, they wouldn't even notice it. But over the course of the long night, that ship could drift far out to sea. It could drift and crash against the islands and so on and so forth. And they could be stranded someplace. So they had to make sure their anchor was secure. That is the purpose of the book of Hebrews, to make sure your faith is anchored in the true faith of Jesus Christ. 
The first piece of that is also part of the passage Elizabeth just read, which is the idea that everything in all creation is now under the authority of Jesus because of his victory over the grave. This evening we're going to pick up in verse 14 because the focus is going to shift now to us as his children. How Christ helps us. He doesn't help the angels, but he helps us humanity as fellow image bearers. So I encourage you to open up the scriptures with me and to leave them open as we study God's word together. They'll also be on the screen. Here's the rest of Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Pray with me. Father, as we open up your word this evening... I pray that your voice would be the voice in this room and on this video, that my words would be few, yours would be many through me. Holy Spirit, guide this conversation. Lord Jesus, be glorified in it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever asked the question or ever wondered why Jesus had to be fully human? In the first century, believe it or not, the issue was not whether or not Jesus was fully God. Actually, most people kind of said, yeah, he probably was. The issue was whether Jesus was fully human or not. Today, we might struggle the other way around. We might struggle with more his deity. We can understand his humanity, but we might struggle with his deity. But still, many today will ask the question, if Jesus was God, why did he have to be human then? Did Jesus need to actually live the life he did so that we could be redeemed? Did Jesus truly have to suffer and die, or could he have waved his magic God wand and make all things good again? Hebrews 2 is going to answer that, and here's the best part. The theological answer is way more beautiful and way more profound than just a simple, uh, he just let bygones be bygones. As we begin, it's important to briefly mention again, the reason for this chapter is that we all have a tendency to drift from orthodox faith. C.S. Lewis in the screw tape letters to the characters of demons says it this way, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without, sign, without signposts. Orthodox is a very important word to know. It's so important that G.K. Chesterton's crowning writing was just simply called orthodoxy. And it's a reminder of just what and why Christians believe what we believe. And there's a series of denominations out there with the word orthodox in, in their name, and that's not really what I'm addressing. What I'm addressing is the idea that orthodoxy is, is the idea of conforming to what is traditional and true. In other words, an orthodox faith is the faith that has been passed down to us from the apostles. We, as fallen sinners, have a tendency to drift from that true faith. Really, if you think about it, since the days of the scriptures were written, we've seen the church wrestle with theological issues that challenge the truths of scripture. During our Dignity of Man study in May, we mentioned Pelagianism, which challenges an orthodox view of whether or not we have a sin nature. Remember, spoiler alert, we do. We've seen the church wrestle with whether or not Jesus was human. That's what's happening here in Hebrews 2. Today we wrestle with whether or not he's actually God. The Reformation was an encounter in the 1500s over returning the Roman Catholic Church to an orthodox view of Christianity that the patristics had, the early church fathers. Basically, it was the Reformers telling the Roman Catholic Church, we need to go back to what they taught not what we think we need to teach now. 
Even today, we see issues that challenge the church's orthodox views. We see challenges like whether or not Scripture is even true, whether or not Scripture even has authority. We see challenges over whether or not Scripture has the right to say what marriage is. We see challenges over whether or not Jesus is even a unique person and whether or not salvation is through Him alone. That is why it is so important to study things like the book of Hebrews. It helps us when we're uncertain. And it's a great reminder for us to return to an orthodox view of faith. Because we will drift. And there's a number of reasons even today we drift. Maybe it's confusing theological ideas. The pastor's not teaching correctly or speaking correctly, or it's a conflicting worldview with what we want. We want to be faithful to the scriptures, but also still keep the relationships with people we have. And so we have things like cultural pressures. Many families are providing cultural pressures on their children. Maybe you've been one of them. Maybe it was not really well, it was not a good thing in your family to be a Christian. Then there's the whole sin and temptation piece that will help us drift. Then there's the life difficulties and challenges we all experience, the sufferings we go through. When we go through it and we ask the question, if God is truly a God of love, why would he let me suffer like this? All of these are why the last few verses of Hebrews 2 are vital for our faith. So let's dive in deeply. It starts with characters known as the children. These are those whom God has created all of humanity, male and female, made of flesh and blood. And then we get this beautiful phrase, he himself, this is Jesus, he himself partook of the same things. That means Jesus was bone of our bones and flesh of our flesh. He had the same physical, chemical makeup as you and me. Every organ, every bone, every system, he had it all. But that phrase also means he got to experience the same things we do. In a paradoxical way, he would have experienced paper cuts and stubbed toes. But he would have also experienced temptations. In fact, Hebrews tells us in chapter 4, he'd have been tempted in every way. He would have had Satan on his back his whole life. But as Hebrews 4 says, he endures it without sin. Imagine all those temptations, the way your addictions and struggles keep you up at night. Yet Jesus never gave in. You know, there actually is a trick to temptations. They're actually very easy to get rid of. Do you know how you get rid of your temptation? You give in to them. If you're an alcoholic trying to stay sober, the easiest way to get rid of those thoughts and those internal voices is just to have another drink. Because the reality is, if you resist, it can be a long, hard night for you. We all know that's the right road, but it's also an impossible road. If you resist, it's a long, long night. Imagine. Never giving in to temptation. The emotional, the spiritual, the physical torture you would endure. That's hard to imagine for one night, let alone two, three, let alone your whole life. That's what Jesus experienced. The physical, spiritual, emotional torture of it all. And yet... Because of his faithfulness, because he ran the race perfectly, he destroys Satan by his death. The interesting part about his death is that his ministry flourishes and gains its power and authority from his death when other priests, their ministry ended with their death. Jesus, it gives him ultimate authority and power. Revelation 1 pictures him holding the keys to death and Hades in his hand. He's got them right here. It's a sign of his power over them, but it's almost a mockery of them. Like, look what I got. It's him mocking Satan because he holds his power in his hand. And because of that, he's able to deliver us, those who were terminally enslaved, 
That's why he has to die. Because it's his death that sets us free from our death and our sin. His death has replaced yours. You no longer are enslaved to your own death. He does this not just for any creature, but for the offspring of Abraham. It's not angels that he does this for, as Hebrews says, because the angels don't sin. They have no need for redemption. But the offspring of Abraham, humanity, well, we've all sinned. And we need redeemed. So the work of Jesus, his love, his sacrifice, it's not done for any creature except for you and me, humanity. All of that builds up to verse 17 when you get a therefore. Do you know what therefore is in Scripture? It is essentially saying everything that I'm about to say hinges on everything I've just said. In other words, because I've already told you all these things that are true, I can tell you this now. And it says that Jesus has to be made, or had to be made human. He had to. He had to become what he needed to save. If he was never human, he could never relate to you and I. He could not help us when we're tempted. He had to be human to experience it all and give us victory. If Jesus had never become bone and flesh, there would be no hope when you're being tempted and when we're struggling. Hebrews tells us he was human in every way, in every respect. As we've already discussed, every part of the human experience, Jesus experienced it himself. He just did so differently. He did it perfectly. All those sins, all those struggles that you have, all those temptations to return to them, he endured it all for one reason, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. He was like us in every way, including the things that tempt us. And because of that, he can relate now. He can be merciful to you because he's been there. You know, sometimes when people tell their story, they'll say something like, you can never fully know as you aren't me. And that's kind of true. The difference is when we talk about Jesus, because he has been there. He can relate as he has truly experienced it all. Feeling betrayed? How about the story of Judas with Jesus? A guy he walks with for three years, and he's sold to him. Sold away by him. How about Peter in that scenario, too, where Peter just kind of runs away and hides and denies ever knowing Jesus? Physical torture? How about the crucifixion story where he's beaten and whipped all night, then he has to drag and carry a very heavy cross, and then he's nailed to it? False accusation? He was innocent, yet he suffered a murderer's punishment. Jesus has become the true victim so that he can become the true high priest. In other words, he can make now a propitiation for the sins of his people. You see, the old system of atoning for sins was incomplete. The the old system of making your wrongs correct was incomplete. The sacrifices, as I mentioned, had to be made over and over and over again. And priests would come and they would go as they died. Just next man up. Just keep them going. That's the old system. But Jesus does something different. He does propitiation. And this is a deep theological word, that, but a very important one. It essentially means that Jesus' death not just solves our problem with sin and covers over it, but it satisfies God's wrath against our intentional mistakes. You see, God hates anything that's going to harm you. God hates anything that's going to keep you from him. And that anger had to be satisfied, and it was in the death and sacrifice of Jesus. So now you no longer have to fear being in his holy presence. You can look at him face to face. Verse 18 continues, reminding us that Jesus was tempted in every way. If his entire ministry was just about his sacrifice... If all he had to do to be truly faithful to his call was to die, 
He could have been hidden away for 30 odd years and then crucified. He could have been stored away in some rich person's castle or mansion and then suddenly appeared and went, all right, it's time for my crucifixion. But because he had a different call, he had a call to be our true high priest. He had a call not just to suffer and die on the cross. He had a call to walk in our steps, tempted in every way. And he does that so that you can run to him whenever you are struggling. Whatever you're going through, run to him. When you're up all night with temptation and you're wrestling like Jacob, run to Jesus. He has victory over the night. He has tons of stories of temptation and victory. Just read the Gospels. When you are lonely, run to him. He was left alone to suffer the night of crucifixion all by himself. When you were poor, run to him. Matthew 8 says he has nowhere to lay his head. I mean, the guy was born in a stable out back. When your family thinks you're nuts for what you believe about Jesus, run to him. In Mark chapter 3, his own family thought he was out of his mind. When you're stressed, run to him. He was so stressed the night before he was crucified, he literally sweat drops of blood. When you are a victim, run to him, because he is both the victor and the victim. Why Jesus had to live fully human is so that we could learn to fully live as humans the way we were intended to. He shows us that example. He gives us the power and the ability to do that now. The way we were always intended to from the garden. So thank God. Jesus not only suffered and died and became our perfect high priest, but he is the one who can sympathize with us because he's endured all temptations. In a moment, we are going to come to the table But as we do, it's right to be reminded and to celebrate the hope and the faith that we have within us. And I'm going to call Nate up so he can get set up. We're going to be singing a song. We've sung it a couple times in this church. Is he worthy? And it's it's a song that asks very similar questions to what we kind of entered into Hebrews 2 with. The work of Jesus, all the things that he's done, the the essence of who he is. It asks if he's worthy of all our praise, if he's worthy of all of it. And it answers with a resounding, he is. Please stand as we profess the hope of faith within us. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from breaking through? We do. Do you wish that we could see it all made? Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? 
Is anyone able to break through the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? story of communion that truly is where that song gets its answer. Not only is he able to sympathize with you because he's been there. He endured it perfectly. And that is worthy of ad all admiration. But the greatest, the crowning achievement of him in becoming our great high priest is that he became both both priest and sacrifice in one instant. That he would endure all temptation, even the idea of being mocked on the cross, and people are shouting, can't you just come down? In his weakest physical moments, he endured so that you could come to this table, the table of the Lord. That this represents, in some ways, a foreshadowing to the great banquet that we will receive in heaven. That every tribe, every tongue, every nation will gather, and every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that He is Lord, because of what this story tells. It tells us that the night He was betrayed, again, able to sympathize with those who have felt betrayal in their life. The night he was betrayed, he's with his disciples celebrating the Passover. And he takes the bread and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And he takes the cup, the cup of salvation, the cup of redemption, and he pours it out. And he says, this is my blood shed 
before you. Take and drink in remembrance of me. And so as his believers, every time we take of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim his death until he returns. We tell the story of him truly becoming our great high priest until he returns. This is not a table for division and strife. And so settle those issues in your heart before you come. This is a table where the church becomes the very one body of Christ we were, in pl- we were intended to be. It's a table of unity, not of the narrative, not of our denomination, not of any denomination, of Jesus Christ. It's a place where he becomes our great high priest for all, once and for all, as we talked about last week. So come, come in the spirit of unity, come in the spirit of his sacrifice, taste and see that he is good. Tonight, come, take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup. Take it, go back to your seat, and reflect on Him being your high priest. Making the sacrifice you can't. Surviving all temptations that you can't. Come. Come and experience the table of the Lord. we praise you for the sacrifice of Jesus. That he became sin. That knew no sin. So that in him, we of people of sin might become the righteous children of you. Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, let us not drift from this table. May we stay very near to the story and the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight, for our uh, offering, in a similar way that we did on Mother's Day, we just want to pray over the fathers and commission them for that work. Uh, The work of parenting is not easy. Uh, and, and, And we all know that there are people that have situations and divisions with family And so, in a lot of ways, the church can replace those people. And so, in a lot of ways, we're we're going to be praying over spiritual fathers as well, um, not just biological ones. So let us pray and commission them as well. Father, we just pray over biological and spiritual parents and spiritual fathers. May there be men of faith in this congregation and in your church globally to raise up sons and daughters of righteousness to do the hard work that is necessary to truly become the image bearers that we are called to be, to be, to serve sacrificially, tirelessly, but more importantly, to lean on Christ and Christ alone. We pray that the work of fathering would not distract the men of this congregation from their, from from Christ, but in fact would enhance that. That there would be no separation between pursuing you faithfully and and loving unconditionally our children. Father, we pray uh, a, a deep Father's prayer. May all of our children come to know and love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Let us stand one more time and close in praise with him of heaven. and you are living your life and you're calling your dad you're calling your spiritual fathers and I encourage you to do that those that you look up to in the faith something we don't always do is truly appreciate those who have led us to where we are so take this time to do that this week but as you go and you're reminded of their faith their faithfulness their steadfastness in your life May you be reminded in, in some ways that that would just be a, a foretaste of the faithfulness and the steadfastness of God the Father in your life.
May you have holy encounters this week. May God put people in your path that you can become a spiritual parent for, that you can begin a discipling relationship for, that can sound a little like that at times. As you go this week, may God the Father, who is way more in love with you than you will ever know, God the Son, who is your true high priest, who can help you resist temptation because he's endured it. And God the Holy Spirit, who speaks the truths of Scripture to help build that anchor of your orthodox faith. May they go with you today and every day. Amen and amen. Let us sing the doxology to close. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son,